as you're, you're probably aware, public confidence in the Supreme Court has kind of reached a, a low recently. What can we as lawyers and judges tell the public with regards to the Supreme Court and the level of confidence that currently we have? Yeah. So let me uh, sort of first say why it is that I think public confidence in uh, the courts and particularly in the Supreme Court is extremely important. I mean, uh, first I think it's important to the court as an institution. Um, uh, you know, the, many people have said this, I'm hardly the first one. The court has, doesn't have the power of the purse, it doesn't have the power of the sword, it has uh, nothing that makes people adhere to our decisions except for um, uh, uh, people's thinking that we are a legitimate institution, handing down legitimate decisions that they ought to follow and respect. Even if, <laughs> you guys, uh, this is a very important question, you know? Um, even if they don't agree with any particular one of them, and that has served the court well over time, to the country well over time. In addition to that, uh, I, 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 I think that the legitimacy of the court is important for the country as a whole. You know, um, I mean, by design, the court does things sometimes that a majority of the country doesn't like. So there are many decisions the court makes saying, you know, you have a right to do this, whatever in Congress thinks about it, whatever a majority of the population thinks about it. And that's, of course, um, uh, uh, an important feature of our system. But I'll remember where I am. <laughs> but. Hold on, let's just see. Do the tech, do the tech folks need a, a couple of minutes? Check one, two. You guys can hear that? There you go. Is this working? Um, you know, but over time, if, you know, um, the thing about judicial decision making is that uh, you can't throw the bums out. Um, we're in there for life, and there's, um, especially with, in, in particular with respect to our constitutional rulings, there's no way for any other branch of government to reverse them. So uh, if the court is, is, and I'm not talking about any particular decision or even any particular series of decisions, but if over time the court loses all connection with the public and with public sentiment, uh, that's a dangerous thing for a democracy. We have a court that does important things. And if there's, that connection is lost, um, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's a dangerous thing for the democratic system as a whole. So that's why the legitimacy of the court is so important. Um, uh, and, and, and why public confidence in, in the court is so important. But then the question becomes, I think you said, well, what could we say to people to foster that public confidence, to, uh, to advance the court's legitimacy? And the, the truth of the matter is, I don't think that there's anything that I or any of uh, my colleagues can do on a stage like this one to say people should have confidence in the courts. The court is a legitimate institution. I think the court earns its legitimacy, and it earns its legitimacy by what it does, by the way it behaves. Again, I'm not talking about any particular decision. There are going to be particular decisions that are going to be unpopular. But over the long haul, over the range of our decision making, um, uh, the, the, the court um, either earns its legitimacy, its confidence, or it loses um, its legitimacy and its confidence. 
And there's nothing I can do to kind of decree public confidence in the court from a stage like this one. Um, uh, instead, you know, I and my colleagues, um, uh, I, you know, the way we behave is what fosters public confidence or what doesn't. So what can the court do to basically regain or increase the confidence in the, the public's confidence in the Supreme Court? What specifically can the court do? Yeah, well, that's a, a, a super hard question, of course. But I think overall, the, um, the way the court retains its legitimacy and fosters public confidence is by acting like a court, is by um, uh, doing the kinds of things that uh, do not seem to people political or partisan, um, by uh, not behaving as though we're just people with individual political or policy or social preferences that we're, um, you know, uh, 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 making everybody live with, but that instead we are acting like a court doing something that is recognizably law-like. Um, and that's where we gain our legitimacy, not because we have better opinions than anybody else. There's no reason why the nine of us should be able to make the rules for a democracy. Nine unaccountable people, people who haven't been elected, there's no reason why the nine of us should have the right to have their opinions um, hold sway, except for the fact that they're doing law and that they're advancing the rule of law in everything that they do. So then I can hear you saying, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and that's obviously a hard question. And different people will have different answers to that question. And there's no single one right answer. But I'll tell you what I think it you know, what I think it means. Uh, the things that a court can do to show people that it is acting like a court, that it is doing law. So um, uh, the first thing is, and I've, I've uh, talked about this throughout my judicial career, is uh, respecting precedent. Um, um, uh, not necessarily in every case we have said over and over that stare decisis, the system of precedent, is not an inexorable command, but you have to have an extraordinary justification to act um, uh, against the prevailing precedent. And the reason that's so important, I mean, there are several reasons. One is that uh, that is what prevents just changes in the composition of the court from, having, from producing changes in our law. I think people are rightly suspicious if uh, you know, one justice leaves the court or dies and another justice takes uh, his or her place and all of a sudden the law changes on you. It's like, what's going on here? That doesn't seem like law. And uh, uh, precedent prevents that from happening, um, an adherence to precedent. And an adherence to precedent also ensures that like cases are treated alike, an incredibly important principle of law. So I would say the first thing is uh, adherence to precedent. I would say the second thing is um, consistent application of methodologies that uh, constrain and discipline judges. Um, you know, if you look over history, there have been times where judges have been unconstrained and undisciplined and have just attempted to basically enact their own policy or political or social preferences. And that's not the monopoly of judges uh, that are appointed by one party or another party. It's happened on both sides. Um, and part of what doing law is about is, is making sure that doesn't happen. And, and judges uh, coming up with methods that constrain them, that discipline them, that prevent them from just willy-nilly putting their policy preferences into law. And there are lots of different, um, or, you know, more than, more than a few uh, uh, different methods that do that. And of course, the grand debate over judicial methodology is a debate over which methods do that better than others. And uh, without talking about that necessarily, I guess what I want to say is you have to have a method that does that, whatever it is. And then you have to, have to consistently apply it. So you can't be 
a textualist on Monday, and then on Tuesday say, oh my gosh, that produces a set of uh, uh, results that I don't like, and do something else entirely. And you can't be an originalist and then say, well, originalism changes in what we look for and the way we apply it in one case to the next case to the next case. You have to apply methods that, in fact, discipline and constrain you, and you have to apply those methods consistently over cases, whether you like the outcomes they produce or whether you don't like the outcomes they produce. So I think that that's the second thing it means to do law. And I think that the third thing it means to do law and not politics and not policy and not just individual preference is, um, has to do with the pace of change and with the scope of decision making. So, you know, the Chief Justice is very fond of quoting um, a statement from Judge Friendly, whom he clerked for, and the, the, the statement goes something like this, if it's not necessary to decide something, then it's necessary not to decide something. And, uh, and that's an extremely important principle for courts, so that they don't just wander around the world saying, you know, we wish this were different. We wish this were different, and let's make it so. Uh, instead, that uh, judges keep to the straight and narrow and decide only the questions that really need to be uh, decided, only the questions that really are before them. So I would say that those three things are what makes a court stay a court. I mean, a court is, you know, it's called a court, but a court can do law or a court can do something else. I would say, and, and again, this is a hard question. There are other answers to this question, but it's my view that what it means for a court to do law is to follow uh, those three things uh, above all um, uh, and, um, and to sort of you know, do them when it's convenient and do them when it's not. Just 